Good afternoon and welcome along to the Keith Andrews Show with you every Thursday at half past 12. Today I'm flying solo, no co-hosts. Two really, really good people into the studio today, legends of their respective sports. Firstly up, Philly McMahon, who popped in about half an hour, 40 minutes ago, just left because he's going to make his way to Mountjoy Prison for his um, twice-weekly visits in there with the inmates and the programme that he runs there. And after Philly, we're going to be joined live in the studio by Graham Sooners. So here is what Philly McMahon had to say a little while ago. Delighted to say, joining the studio, and usually different sportsmen in this week, but genuinely really delighted to have you in. You're a busy man, I know. Thanks for popping in to see us. Thanks very much for having me in. You've been very busy. Latest engagement. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations yeah, on that. But Thank you. Obviously, the, the career, the different aspects to your, to your business now, fitness, nutrition, working at Mountjoy Prison. Mm. When does sleep come into the equation? Yeah. Um, believe it or not, I've calculated now time-wise, I probably have about six hours a day to live and the rest <laughs> I do with other stuff, but uh, a life is good and I'm doing things I love doing mm. uh, and that's very important. I'm very lucky to have uh, a company where I have brilliant staff, self-motivated self staff, um, getting the season finished earlier this year so that allows me to do other things mm. that I really, I'm really passionate about. I want to bring you back a bit. I want to, we'll chat about the business ventures and bits and bobs that you do ongoing. But I want to bring you back to something which I, I didn't realise until I started reading up on you and doing a little bit more digging. You went you went on trials to Nottingham Forest. Yeah, yeah. When you were about fourteen. I, I was I was actually there obviously before you would have been there on, on trial at, at a similar type of age, 13, 14. How how did that come about? I didn't even realise you you played yeah. football. I just thought you were solely Gah. Gaelic. Yeah, soccer yeah, was my first games. sport actually. Yeah, um, so. I played soccer from the age of seven uh, with Ballymun United. Ballymun Town was at that mm. stage, amalgamated to Ballymun United. And at an age, at a, I think maybe it been 11 or 12, I went down and joined Belvedere. And my level then of uh, my technical ability went up a little bit. I had the physical ability. Find a help in the game if they yeah, kind of counseled. Yeah, definitely they did, yeah. So I was playing both then at that stage at school and Ballymun Kickhams. And at the age of 14, I got a trial with Nottingham Forest. Um, Really brilliant experience. Went over, uh, stayed in the Trent Stadium, which is the, the cricket yeah, ground. Which is, the road. It's like that. I think it's Heininger Carlsberg Carlsberg, where you, you wake up in the stadium. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You got woken yeah. up by a cricket match one morning. So it was a brilliant experience. Um, me and another guy from Ballymun went over, came back and had an option of going for one or two other trials, mm -hmm. but actually gave it up straight away and went to play Gab because. I was going to school and, and at that stage my club by the way Kickham's the manager was Paddy Christie playing for the yeah. dubs and he was looking after the lads really well. So I was going down with a massive amount of pressure on me playing soccer with people screaming on sidelines and, and scouts yeah, and stuff like yeah. that. And when I went and played guard, it was, it was a little bit of a different environment. Um, so I actually just gave up soccer completely then. Played it was the bit. age that wasn't it, where you kind of had to make a bit of a decision because yeah. I would have I played a little bit for Vincent's, played mm. school by to reach. They, they're the enemy. They're our rivals. They're the enemy. Sorry, buddy. Um, they were a close one to the school, and I, I, there would have been a proper battle on because football, soccer was my first love, and I, but I did love watching Gaelic, watching the dubs, playing it as well because I felt that toughened me up for for football, and yeah. I felt like then football was was kind of easy then. But it was that that age, wasn't it? Yeah. 13, 14, where yeah. you kind of have to go one way or the other. I was very lucky that um, I had a guy, as I said, Paddy Christie, understood the energy I had. Yeah. Uh, I was, you know, growing up I had a lot of anger and aggression built up because of my brother's issues uh, at home uh, and I pushed that into sport so I developed a kind of a style, um, a kind of a physical style that kind of worked really well in sport, yeah. whether that be ga or whether it be soccer. Sometimes in soccer I was probably too, too aggressive <laughs> so yeah. it fitted well with Gaelic football. Yeah, so was, was the soccer, was it ever a serious option? Like when you went over there were you thinking this could be an opportunity or was it yeah. suck it and see? Like I know you mentioned that you, maybe if the opportunity came around again two, three years later, you may well have grasped or you may well have made more of it at that time. I always think back that if I had went on an, another trial, um, that I would have been a more experienced. Um, when we went over, it was actually the hottest day that, that England had ever recorded. It was like 36, yeah. 36 38 degrees. It was crazy. And we were playing a, a team from Mexico kind of a, an all-star team from Mexico and an, all, an all-star team from from America. And it was, when I look back, it was quite strange because you're playing with, they were all trialists. 
there was no, you weren't blended in with the academy. Mm. It was all trialists, guys from all over the world. It's tough that now, isn't it? And you're like, how can I express myself Shine, here and yeah. show you what I'm doing? And I only, like, I, I'm sure they were judging you off your, your standards of your values and stuff like that and the standards of, of who you are as a person. Because I remember, actually, um, they had this rule, you had to tuck your T-shirt in. Yeah. And the head of the academy was walking around checking for these little things. And I remember um, the coach that was looking after us came up and said, which one of you had your T-shirts out? And it was me. Was it? And and one of the Irish guys goes, it was him. I was like, you know, well, like, you know. Yeah. So I said, oh, it was me. He stuck my t-shirt back in. He said, give me ten press ups. So that later that we the match played that match match the following day, and the guy goes to me, yeah, oh, we weren't allowed to drink Coca Cola. Mm. We were we were out having carbs, and we were having pizza. And I was like, geez, we're having pizza, but we're not allowed to drink Coca Cola. <laughs> so one of the lads, the same lad that ratted me out, had a, had a can of Coke. And uh, I hope you stitched him up, isn't I, I went up to the coach and said, Are we allowed to drink Coke? Can we order a can of Coke? And he says, No. I said, All oh, right, I thought we were allowed. And I just point, and your man got caught. So I was delighted to get it back to him. But uh, it was very hard to express, it was very hard to show the capabilities. Now, they said they had recordings of me and stuff yeah. like that. But I would have likened to give another, another trial to see how well I would have went. But the players I'm dealing with now, I deal with a lot of uh, young players that are going over to England. And the process I'm seeing them going through. Majority of them going through, not all of them, because there is a majority that are doing really well and, and making a career out of it. Mm. But there's a majority of them going over and really struggling coming back, and that's worrying. And, and, and I suppose when I'm looking at that, I'm going to go, could I have went that way? Mm. So I'm, I'm passionate about We speak a lot about it on this show and in general, and I, I try and advise a lot of those younger players that are either going or not happening, and soon they become just a number and they're, they're yeah. thrown to one side. Mm. You speak quite a lot about where you're from, Ballymun, with yeah. pride and the route you went down and, and using it in the right way. The, the schoolboy team I would played for was, was a club called Stella Mars down the road from yeah, Belva. Yeah. And uh, we had three lads in Ballymun on the team. And I remember... Was it Matty McManus one? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was. Richie Peter Partridge. Rogers. Richard Partridge was Very that good, team. Yeah, yeah, I remember watching them. Yeah. I would have went down with my brother to Albert College to watch them games. Did you really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we had, like, we had a, a proper team. Like yeah. a lot of the that team, like seven or eight, nine of us would have been in the Irish and the fifteens and sixteens team. But I remember, like these lads, like came in and I was speaking about the Gaelic when I was playing that tough for me up. These lads came in and we signed lads from Fingless and mm. it, it, I remember thinking, I need to be on my game here. I need to be tough. I need to be need to be like show that you're able to deal with this. And then we started to go on this trial. We all bonded really well. We got on great, and the parents had a really kind of good social aspect around it as well. But I always remember that their parents would say to my parents, you know, that they have to make it. They have to make it. that's their that's their route out of out of out of Ballymore, out yeah. of out of the life that mm. they've kind of been living. And and I, and I remember thinking that as a as a 12, 13 year old kid going like, what are you on about? Like all I do is get up go to school, play with my mates, I come back, I play in the park, I do my homework, I go to bed, like it was just like that. But obviously, we were training together twice a week and playing a game on a weekend. You never, you don't realise exactly what what they're going through, even What's though you're, yeah. Sport. And it, yeah. unfortunately for, for those, they couldn't maximise the opportunity. I, I've, heard, I've heard that before, like I've trained a couple of guys that, and um, they've took contracts in England that weren't really worth their value uh, as players and you, you hear that a lot, you know, well it's better that he's out of the environment he's in. And it's a shame because I think that's where maybe some organisation needs to step in and look at, maybe it's the, the FEI steps in and says, right, okay, we need a fund out of the, you know, some, some pocket of finances there to actually look at the players that are going through poverty because they need to be focused on, because if they don't make it, they're the ones that are left I destroyed, enjoy. absolutely yeah. destroyed. Their life is over. Mm. They are only seen as footballers. Mm. So when they come back, they're failures and they struggle with mental health and their life is, they, they kind of reflect back in life and go, what was that all about? Like, mm. why, why, why did I go that route? Why did I think I could just only be that person? So it's being refined or, or, or defiant, sorry, as, as a footballer. Like I, I had a guy over from England um, and he was six foot four, massive guy, and he was a centre half. And he was like, you know, the, the manager keeps talking about me speed, and I need to work on my speed. And I was looking at him going, 
and then his a- agent was saying to me, I need you to work on his, his, his uh, him getting stronger and, mm. and more physical because he's, uh, he's so big and all. And I'm looking at this guy and he's hunched over and I'm like, right, there's confidence issues here. Right? So I says to him, let me video you. We, we had a talk first, went down another training session with him and I'm looking at his mechanics and I can see him falling forward, not activating his glutes, not getting enough knee drive. I'm like, right, there's something here. So I said to him, who are you? And first thing he starts off with is a footballer, and he talks like for about ten minutes about football. Mm. I'm like, is that all you are? Right? Are you defined as just a footballer? So I started working with him um, when he went back to England. He was working on um, going and doing other things outside the sport that made him feel better. So yeah. that when he played sport, he felt great. So he went and started feeding the homeless. He went to preseason. Went in preseason. He was, he was with Redden, and. Uh, when he got his testing back, he says, Philly, look at, look at my results, the fastest player on the team. Mm. Now, <laughs> a couple of weeks later, he was like, down and down to Billwall. But, <laughs> but his comms, so he was, his, his comms had a, an impact on his, his mechanics because he was hunched over and he wasn't able to move. So just a small thing like yeah, that had a that huge made impact. a big though. difference. But the, with, with the GAA, in terms of the players, I know it's slightly different, it's a lot different, but with the lads going away to England and then they come back and then that, like I left at 15 and then if you didn't go at that age, you kind of probably would have missed the boat. Now it's different with the underage, I sorry, the national underage teams that we've got in place now. So there's a different pathway for them and League of Ireland is doing better now than it's done probably in the last mm-hmm. 15 to 20 years. But with Gaelic, in terms of the authorities and lads that lose their way a little bit, is there better? Infrastructure yeah, in place for There's a better network. Uh, I, had a, I had an argument with my friend one day. There was a soccer club in Ballymun, and there was an overlap of guys playing soccer and, and ga. Mm-hmm. And they were getting to that age, as you said, that where they needed to choose which one did they go with. And I said to him, he played for the soccer club, and I said to him, they're probably better off playing gay football. No disrespect to the club, no disrespect mm-hmm. to the sport. And he says, What do you mean? I said, Well, look, look at the amount of players on Ballymun Kickham senior team that have degrees that um, have, have employment rights. So they all have, the majority of them have degrees. There was two doctors, there, were, there was three or four teachers. They were all employed. And when someone was unemployed, there was an opportunity for them to go, right, I'll link you in with somebody to get a job. And then I said, look at the soccer club and look, what, look, look at the education, look at the unemployment. It doesn't mean they're happy or unhappy, but in terms of career-wise, they were better off. And, and he was arguing and arguing. And then one day, we were driving the road about two years later, and uh, one, of that, one of them kids was standing outside the book, he's unemployed, and I said, there you go. Mm. And he said, you know what, you're right, Philly. So, um, as harsh as that sounds, it's no disrespect to, to soccer. I played both, uh, and it's not just because I play Gal now at a, level, at a certain level, but in, in terms of the culture of Gaelic football, it's really strong. Mm. There's a massive, it's the biggest network, I would say, in this country right now, Gaelic football is. Um, and there's, a, there's, there's that support chain around you. So that support chain you're mentioning as well, so you've, you you had to go back and do your leave and say it, didn't you? Was, were they there to help you along that way or did that come from you or did that come from your family or well, was it the club or was it... Yeah. Was it the county involved? Ballymun was, it, it's the, the, the club, Ballymun Kickhams, is, is developed through two communities, Glasnevin and Ballymun. Yeah. And Paddy Christie was heavily involved, that wasn't he? Yeah, he was the coach all the way up. So Paddy, Paddy would have, um, he would have, he would have seen that the, the both communities can rub off each other. Yeah. You know, the, the little bit of energy madness yeah. that the Ballymun lads had and the education and, and um, the drive that the, the Glass Nevin kids had. So that rubbed off on us. So I got to a stage where I matured in life and I said, right, I actually want to go back and do a degree because I've seen all these guys do it. I was in the Dublin change rooms at development ages and, and they were all doing degrees and doing, and I kind of got to the stage where I said, I want to do this, I want to prove to myself that I can go and do this. Mm. And I went and asked Paddy Christie, what, what do I do? How, How do I actually go about do it? it? Like in school I wasn't very yeah. academic, wasn't even thinking that way. And him and Ian Robertson, who was another Dublin player and Bally Moon Kickham's player, they sent me down and said, you were able to do this, no problem. We'll link you in with DCU. Then I met with uh, Niall Moyna, who was head of the Gaelic football team down there, and, and he's involved in sports science. And uh, they just gave me the two processes. Well, you wait till you're a mature student or you, you go back and repeat your leave insert. And at that stage, I had a, a, I'd, I'd bought a car and I was stuck with that loan. And I was absolutely broke. I said to my parents, I'm going to go back and repeat my leaving cert. I'm not going to wait till I'm 23. Mm. 
And they said, look, we'll look after you, roof over your head, food on the table. And uh, I said, right, okay. I said, but I need to get money somewhere. So I went back and repeated my lives. So driving into school with this fancy car. I'm sure the students were saying to me, is this either a teacher or a drug dealer coming in? <laughs> and I was yeah. broke. I had like two euro a day to live off. And I'd buy a bottle of water. And I'd buy a long pan at the start of the week with a packet of ham. And I'd make a sandwich. Week. And that perseverance was, was massive for me because I got to the stage where I got asked to, to teach uh, a kids team in an attic space in Ballymun Kickham, so it wasn't a gym. That's mm. how it all began. I was absolutely broke, and I, I, I was earning 60 euro a week, which then four women asked me after that, I see you training teams up there, would you train us? And that escalated into mm. where I am today in terms of business. You seem, you seem quite proactive. You seem to, like you enjoy and you embrace these types of challenges. Obviously the sport element is, is central to that and mm. the gaily, but then all these other branches off it. So like the nutritional side, the, the fitness side, it's obviously something that, it's not just gonna be during your career, you're obviously yeah. gonna kick off in different directions and keep it going. Yeah, I, I'm excited uh, for building platforms. Yeah. So I've had sport as a platform to help others. And that actually came about strangely enough when a, a player on the pitch abused me, but I like, was it? Yeah, and it, it kind of slipped out of my mouth. I, I was so frustrated that day. Uh, it slipped out of my mouth and I started speaking about my brother's addiction, you know? And from that day, I understood that I had a purpose in life. You know, that the, the impact I had when people were contacting me, asking to speak about my experiences and thanking me for, you know, coming out and saying, you know, my brother was an addict and, and, and talking about them issues. That was the day that I realized that I constantly have to build platforms and sport, as a platform won't be around forever. So I'm planning for the next platform. Yeah, one of them you're, you're going in today is the venture in Mountjoy Prison. I've seen the documentary recently, which I found fascinating in terms of the interaction that you have with them and clearly the, the joy and satisfaction that they get out of it. But yeah. it was also very evident that you get it as well. Mm. Yeah. How did that come about, that one? Basically, I was playing a match against Vincent in the <laughs> semi-final of the club championship. We got beaten, and there was after the match, kids come onto the pitch, and you sign a couple of jerseys. And this 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 guy got over the fence, came over to me, and uh, I was kind of a bit strange. It's like this fella's not asking for his autograph. He's a bit old for it. And he says, "Look, I'm the governor now. Joy, would you come in and do a talk?" And says, that was it, was it? Yeah, governor right. Governor Mullins came over. Eddie Mullins came over to me and said, uh, "Would you come in?" Because he was aware of your other business ventures and what you were doing, and yeah, he just thought yeah. that would be well. He. For me, I was really interested in, in working with him because I'd worked with other people like him, but I, obviously I didn't know what he was like there. But when I spoke to him after a couple of meetings with him, I was like, I can learn from this guy. Mm. And I love being around people that I can learn. Another guy that I would have been very similar to him was, was, is Trevor Crawley, um, who, sure. who's with Bowles and Sherman Grovers. I worked with him. I just constantly learn from these mm. type of people. But anyway, he came, I went in and done the talk and he said, Philly, I don't know how many people is going to be here. The cell's open at a certain time, you could have five, you could have ten. Yeah. The place was packed. Was it? And I was like, right, great, this is, this is a good sign, there's a good, there's a good crew here. They all sat down and went, oh, damn, I can't tell the story that I was about to tell. Because there was five of my mates in the story sitting in front of me. <laughs> so, they were the standards of my culture and I was probably, well, potentially be one of them or yeah. be on drugs or end up dead or commit crime. So, uh, I felt... It was literally five familiar faces five right in front yeah, of sitting in front of me, yeah. So, for me, I started off, I'd done the talk, had, had a kind of a relatable impact with these guys. They asked, could I come back in and do some gym sessions with them? Did that. Mm. And then I went back to the governor and I said, look, there's something special here. And he said, what do you mean? I said, there's, there's good cultural things happening that we need to shine the light on. If we can develop a program or a movement that can change the culture in the prison, wouldn't that be amazing? Mm -hmm. Nowhere in the world has done that. Like that, when there's drugs in the prison, that people aren't taking drugs based on on choice. So that's the big problem. We're never going to get rid of drugs outside the prison and inside the prison. But if we can get into individuals and change their self beliefs, they will make the choice not to take drugs and will change the norm. Then yeah. So it's, it's very engrossing when you when you're, when you're in there. If you want to learn about human beings, go to Mount Joy for a couple of days. Really, it's powerful. Like you know. Yeah. So twice a week you're in there. Tuesdays, yeah. Thursdays. Yeah, we're only in there like... Uh, How many are taken now a week? Like what? It, there must be a huge clamour for it. How many do we, do we have yeah. in the programme? The programme, I don't know if I can course. Can I course? Yeah, the programme's on. called the Unfucked Movement. 
right? And uh, unfucked stands for uh, the way you spell it. It's U N F U C C C K E D, and the C C C stands for culture, community, and change. Right. Right. So it, it's basically changing the individual self belief. So when they reintegrate in society, that they they have a different external environment. Right. Right. So it's called restorative justice. So prison, when you commit a crime, you're punished by, they, they take your liberty. But there's a second part to that, which is rehabilitation. And it's not really there at the minute. In other words, if these people get back out in society and they keep, they, they haven't changed within the prison, re they'll re-offend. It'll cost the country millions. Mm. Uh, the consumers, I think it, it costs us 422 million at the minute from just petty crime in mm. terms of robbing and stealing. So it's incredible that we haven't really focused on that enough. And some people go, well, Philly, you're helping drug dealers and murderers and all these things. But I'm helping them so that when they get out, that there's not more victims. Yeah. So there's not victims like yeah. my brother was or certain families have already been mm. victims from. Is there any challenges in there? Is there any all the time. Or? All the time. The, the culture is, is based on fear. It's based on ego. Um, you know, years and years ago in, in Mount Joy, I believe, you know, people would have solved a lot of problems by just having a, a bit of a, a fisty cuff and that was it. Mm. Now people are getting stabbed. Yeah, and, and yeah. it's gone up a lot. But you've got good people in management in Mount Joy that understand that there's a, there's, there is a different way mm. to do things. You mentioned someone there, um, Trevor Crawley, who you've learned off and you were in with Shamrock Rovers a few years ago, uh, doing the strengthening condition side of things there. In terms of the sports, the difference, and I know you've been involved with Camogie as well, so mm. the different sports, the different requirements for, for the athletes, so you as a, as a full-back, as a cornerback, and me as a centre midfielder or a winger, so I think when I first started, and probably until the last five, seven years, it was all very generic. Yeah. Whereas now it needs to be so specific, doesn't it? I presume you're not doing the exact same as, as the likes of Mannion and, mm. and Callahan in terms of the training. There's individual programmes, certainly gym base as well, but... What, what did you take from the, the football side of being on Shamrock Rovers or from that, looking at that sport in particular? When, when I was with Shamrock Rovers, um, the problem we had was that there was, there was probably a negative culture there. Um, that's probably, you see, you, unfortunately, you kind of inherit players yeah. whether they have good attitude or bad attitude and we inherited a, a few players that had bad attitude in, in, in Trevor's first year um, then he brought players in with names and stuff like that and when you work with Shamrock Rovers there's a, a, an expectation that Pressure, you have to be successful mm. no matter what time you have that might have changed a little bit now but um, the fourth highest budget in the league um, hadn't won, hadn't won uh, anything in, in maybe two or three seasons and hadn't won apart from the, the, the kind of the, the, the success that that uh, Michael O'Neill had hadn't won that in a very long time. But the expectations were up through the roof. Huge, yeah. Um, so, but, but when working with Shamrock Rovers, uh, there was a there, there wasn't a culture in the club, right? So we went. Is that strange for you coming from mm. a Dublin environment where it's it's engrossing you? And I presume. Ballymun Kickham's in terms of your club, it's just from all the way up that you have that culture, you have that pride and you step into a Rovers or, and I, and I, and I would say it would be quite common because I've often made the references about rugby, the, the provinces, obviously with Ireland, mm. Gaelic, it's, it's, it's the same, but with football, it's very, very different. Yeah, look, Sh Shamrock Rovers is very similar to the international setup right now, mm. right? The, the, the base of the fans and, and everybody around the, the, the football circle are getting kind of pissed off at yeah. FAI yeah. and pissed off at the mm. football and looking to point the finger at other things. And, and then they're looking at, oh, well, it has to be this style of football, which I, I don't disagree with. Uh, it has to be, you have to be put more into the electricity league. We have to, um, you know, have a, a the development strategy through. There's no culture. Mm. There's absolutely no culture. You can have all the strategy you want. But if you don't have a culture, mm. the way players' behaviours, the values, the way, what they, the way they abide by things, that doesn't matter. Mm. Once you come up against another country that has good cultures, you will always get beaten, right? So, you know, when in the past Ireland has been successful, they've had players that have understood a bit of a culture about the country and what they've done. And I'm not saying it's the players' fault, I'm definitely not. But there's no probably culture with that I've known of mm. speaking to international players, especially before the Euros there recently. The culture is probably not there. If you can put a culture structure in, in, in place 
I believe that could have a positive impact. No difference to what Shamrock Rovers needed. So what was what was the process then? Because I would have been involved coaching wise with some of the underage teams, and one of the things we would have tried to implement would be so you're getting a group of twenty lads together, young lads, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen year old lad, the age group. What we would have done would have been you give them ownership of it, mm. you make them accountable, you give them the responsibility. One of the first questions we asked one of the underage teams was, what, what do you think the perception of Ireland is? Because we were going to be going and playing against Germany and Spain and Italy, all these yeah. teams. And then a few shouts around the room, pride, tackles, blah, you know. One of them said, technically brutal. Mm. We were like, well, do you think you're technically brutal? And we were like, no, we don't. So we're going to keep that fire, we're going to keep that. So yeah. we created in those underage teams that togetherness, but that, look, this is what we are, this is what we stand for. Mm. And I think you're right, it's not, it's not across the board. And we've certainly gone away from it in terms of our national team in the last couple of years in particular. But with, with Shamrock Rowers, as, as an example, club-wise, managers are going in and it's just, it's the time. Mm. That culture, that ethos, that philosophy, whatever way you want to put it, has to come with results. And it's just, it's getting that balance, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, the only way you can do it with the change over in management in, in, in soccer, you need to have somebody in behind the scenes that's, that's developing it, that, yeah, that steer it all the way through. Um, and that has to be given time, right? Because time is, is the most important thing. Because if you have a manager that brings in a culture and he lives with that culture, you're kind of back to square one, which which happens in, in, in terms of in GA, happens all the time around the, the country. You, you look at all the teams in Leinster, a lot of the teams in Leinster, and their, their lifetime span of the managers, they keep changing. Whereas we've had Jim Gavin now for a period of time, which has helped us build and build and build, right? So um, that that's important that, that these kids, and it's it's happening right now in Shamrock Rovers, by the way. So the airport. Yeah, they have. Yeah, we I've went, um, <clears throat> believe it or not, and it kind of started when Trevor was in there because we went to Malmo, we looked at their framework and their structure and stuff like that. And when we went back, we started implementing it. So we started looking at ex-players coming in and mm. taking teams and stuff like that. And that's... It's, it, it's, it's, it's blossoming now because yeah. of that and, and they're giving um, the current management team a good bit of time which is important for them to grow but for me um, yeah I think it's that saying that you know culture eats strategy for breakfast you know if, mm. if, if, if the problem I would see is that there's a lot of money t and time spent in getting badges in soccer yeah right yeah. and sometimes a lot of coaches will think this is the only way we should do things and if they just expand it into different sports, yeah. it could have mass food. Yeah, yeah. There's, a lot, <coughs> there's a lot of <coughs> my friends who have retired, <coughs> excuse me, and they get put off because of not so much not so much the badges, the licenses, because I think that the structure that you get from them can be be beneficial, but it's most certainly not all about them. Yeah. It's the it's the experiences that you can bring. Yeah. Like some of the traditional managers, and I don't know whether it's the same in, in Gaelic, but some of the the old school type managers I would have had it like Sam Allardyce, Trapatone, they walk into a room, they own it, they've got presence, mm. they can manage a group of players, they can own the room, no problem. Mm. Whereas you're going on these courses and it's like it's great, you put on your, your presentations and you can go out and you can take a you can take a session with so many players and on attack yeah. and on transitions, blah blah blah, all this type of thing. But you learn more, probably not more, you learn as much on these courses mm. from the people you're on the courses with, from yeah. their experiences. So like us spending half an hour together, you pick a couple of things out and you go, that was really good, blah, blah. And you going to Malmo getting these infrastructures yeah. in place. What what's the process in Gaelic then? So Jim Gavin on his route to, to where he's gone to now doesn't have to go through all those courses obviously I presume, yeah. does he? No, no. Um yeah, like I mean you you spoke about giving them young lads ownership and responsibility. That's the Dublin, that hasn't been a secret. That's mm. the Dublin culture. That's a player-centric led culture. Um, that players, you know, when you talk about managers owning a change room, I think that's important. But what's more important is that you have a manager that gets the best out of your players. Yeah. Um, and sometimes when you have a manager that comes in that wants the own, the priority is to own the change room, there's a disconnect, mm. right? There's, there's, a, there's that. It kind of you, you lose that approachability to go go and say things to management and and I think a manager that be, one of the best traits a manager could have is being a good listener, like you know. So and I think probably the international scene hasn't had that for a while, like mm. 
So being able to, and, and I believe Stephen Kenny could be a really good a good man manager coach that listens well mm. because he's had players um, in Dundalk where their backs have been against the wall when they first started to create that success and he's got the best out of them. And they created a structure at that club and it took a little bit of time but he, he created that. Mm. So that, that club now has an identity. Whereas for years and years, obviously it didn't, and you see other clubs. And it's the, look, the League of Ireland is very difficult in terms of player contracts. There's the constant kind of lure of going across the water and, yeah. and earning more money if the lads really shine in the League of Ireland. But yeah. he has created a culture and a philosophy. And I think that's probably yeah. what they're going to be doing with Mick. I'd love, I'd love to see has he actually has he a blueprint of what his culture is. I'd love to see that. I don't know if he has. Mm. If he has, I'd love to see it because I think it'd be really intriguing. Uh, I know guys have walked in there. Uh, I know I've spoke to players that have played under them, and I I, I, I tried to get a little bit out of them to see if they've got a blueprint bits, of how they've done it, and yeah. and I, I don't know if they have. I think it's one of them things where they've they've had a group of players that were kind of like, where what are we doing in our career? What have we achieved? Mm. And let's just go after it. And then they've got a, sm a, a sniff of belief, and they've built on that, and built on it, and built on it. And then every time they've brought players in, it's added to it. It's added the energy, and then the right success is well, kind of... It? Yeah, and then you have to remember, see the Air Tristy League, I find it very easy to break down. Like um, You have two top teams, generally, and then two top teams do well, because <clears throat> first of all, the players want to go to them because they're probably getting the good money, mm. the best money in the league. Uh, they probably play in Europe. And, you know, then what happens is the, the other teams below that, they, they, they will always struggle to keep build them because the players will essentially if they have a good player they'll go to England yeah, look yeah. at Bowles this year they have two lads now in England mm -hmm. that, that were with them they have they have three lads that have left for, for certain yeah, reasons good, yeah. Some, Dan Casey going down to, to Cork and stuff like that so you, you'll have that but it's about developing your brand right that's what the interest that's the missing piece I feel if you're not the top two develop your brand right so that t players like they will they won't. Money will come down. Will have a big factor to it. But ultimately, I love playing here. Yeah, you'll attract the I right love players. Playing it. It's you know. I think that's that's very important. With, with Dublin, then in terms of that philosophy, that ownership, I was lucky to spend a little bit of time and watching you trying. The first thing that struck me was the atmosphere. It had it was it's quite hard to describe it, and I don't think it was a, a full on session. The one I went with would have been more low key, so maybe that was a little bit to do with it. Mm. But the atmosphere was you could tell it was a really nice, friendly environment that, that everybody enjoyed being at staff, obviously players. But when it became training time, it was like bang, we're on this. Yeah, it was, it was just. It was, it was hard to put your finger on it because as part of my coaching badges and licence I've travelled to different environments different sports was in with the Ireland rugby team and very different atmosphere with them where you it was kind of and we mentioned the word ownership it was as if nothing was really said from staff wise but when training started the whistle went from the fitness coach wherever bang yeah we're on it we're on it is that just ways have got to yeah yeah it, it's, it's one of them things where as soon as it, it kind of has a little it has kind of steps to it, like as soon as you drive in the grounds, you're kind of right. You, you start to leave everything behind, mm -hmm. everything in life. You try you try leave that at the gate, and then you do your little your little preparations. That everybody has their own individual preparation. You're, you're getting your head right. You're getting your body right. You're doing your activation stuff, and then um, and then you're looking for gains. You're looking for right. What am I going to do today? That's going to help me now play. The, play at a certain level in terms of a, a performance in a match and then you have everybody pulling you along you know and some days you might struggle some days psychologically or physically you might struggle but these boys are pulling you along so going back to that player player centric culture and do you know what sometimes it's hard to leave t stuff behind like I struggled the last two years with my dad's illness yeah, yeah. Um, but to have them boys pull you along that's the only reason why I was probably still there mm. it's like what what does it mean like I I I grew up watching Dublin train and Parnell Park Tuesdays and Tours going down and that would have been early 90s before obviously winning it for the first time in a long time in 90, 95 wasn't it? 95 yeah. And watching like Paul Clark and Curran and Keith Barr and I, I sported three teams as a kid. Ireland was first, Dublin and Liverpool were like 
close. You know, I'm an Everton fan. Are you an Everton fan? Yeah. This isn't going well, is it? Vince is that Liverpool. Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, but I'm not that bothered about Liverpool anymore, to be fair. Or Vince, yeah. to be fair. I'm the same with yeah. Everton, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, I just, anybody that wore that shirt, Ireland, like random Ireland players, and I look back now and I think, oh my God, I worship him. He's got about like three caps or five yeah. caps or just because he scored one goal, like this yeah. player called Bernie Slavin like played and he was sent to 40, a handful of caps. And it was the same with, with Dublin. Anybody who wore that shirt, you just you just had on a pedestal. Now, I think when I was playing for Ireland, sometimes you'd, you'd forget about that, but you're engrossed in life in Dublin. Like how, how much do you feel that? How, how much pressure do you feel with that? Uh, the pressure, nice pressure. Very, very little pressure, um, because it's kind of you're kept grounded a lot. You know, you're kept grounded a lot. Uh, I'll give internally, you internally and externally, like both. Because uh, I am very fortunate. I've got to a stage where I realised that putting on the jersey makes a lot of people happy. Mm myself first of all and then the impact it has on other people is amazing a lot of times people ask how can you stay motivated you're going for five in a row how do you you know the motivation is really deep for me it's really special in that my dad's last all Ireland was last year and that was a huge special gift that these guys everybody from the kit man to the management team to, to the players to Everybody, my family, they, they all gave me that gift to give me that little bit of support to get me to the stage where I could see, he could see my last all Ireland. And I know that th that happens for other people. So there's people in that stadium that don't have, they, they don't have time mm. in their life. They're, they're, they could be very ill. When we win an all Ireland, we go to the, the, the hospitals the next morning and you see very Schools. ill kids. So how can you not enjoy that time? Especially when you've, you've got probably le about 10 years if you're lucky, maybe 12. If you're Stephen Clucks and you've got 40 years. <laughs> but, Still going. Uh, but but we, you have to grasp it. Mm. You have to take that time when you have it because it's the most when important. Did you start, when did you start to really appreciate it? Here, most sports people, I think, when they're mm. younger, they, they maybe take it for granted at different levels. Yeah. When did you kind of think along those lines where this isn't going to last forever and it's been a really special period in, in Dublin GA history? Yeah. So wh wh when was it when you thought, yeah, I need, to, I, need to, um, I need to enjoy every single minute of this. There was a light bulb moment in 2013. I had the cup and I was bringing it to a youth club to do a talk. And I walked into my me, me house and all these kids came over and asked me for, for my autograph. And I was like, cool, no bother. Uh, I went back into the house, got a bit of lunch, came back down. And one of the, the, the brothers, kid, one of the brothers of the, the kids I was signing the jersey came over and said, oh, I missed you, can I get an autograph? And I said, yeah, no problem. And he said, um, he said are you famous? You famous looked up at me and I was like, oh, what do I say here? And before I even said yes or no, he said, you must be, you're on telly. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Then he said, but hold on, you can't be famous because you're from Ballymun. Right? So I sat down on the pat, right? There was me, the kid, and the cup for about 10 minutes. And I'm sure cars driving by were going, what the hell is going on? <laughs> Crashing like, into the crazy, like, yeah. I don't know what I gave that kid that day. Mm. I don't know. I hope I gave him something, right? Some little bit of. Uh, a boost of encouragement from something I said, right? But I felt great. I felt amazing. I felt three foot taller. And I remember speaking to a friend of mine who was a personal development coach and I said it to him, I told him that story and he said, right, he said, that's what you need to do in life. He said, get as many people as you can on the biggest path as possible and go after that. Because when you're dead and gone, that's what you'll be remembered for. Not how many all Ireland you have or what house you have or what car you have or how much money you have, but how much energy you give people. So that's when it tweaked that sport can be a very powerful thing in terms of a platform to help others. So every chance and every bit of time we have, I'm going to use it. Mm. Listen, that's a nice way to, to end it. We could chat here for the next few hours. Yeah. No problem at all, but I've totally enjoyed it. Hopefully get you in again some stage. And Definitely. You'll be back training after Christmas? January, yeah. Team holiday on the 28th to the 9th. So. Nice. Well deserved. Looking forward and to that. And straight back into it. That's it. Yeah. Really, yeah. been a pleasure. Thanks very much. Thanks for having Cheers, me on. Pal. Cheers. So that was Philly McMahon. Real gent. Fair play to him coming in. A busy day. Another man with a busy schedule who's made his way in. Delighted. <laughs> We've roped him out of the Virgin Studio. Not normally over here on a Thursday. Appreciate you coming in. Mr. Pleasure. Christmas. Pleasure Thanks. to be here. Proper this is a nice studio. Football and royalty in the building. Yeah, right. Enjoy your time over here, don't you? I love it. Um, 
easy for me to sit here and say that, you know, he's endearing himself to Irish people, but I do love Dublin. I oh, love you do, that. you're genuine about it. We spent a little bit of time going to studios and golf courses the last Not few as years. much time on the golf courses as we should be, but no. weather permitting, maybe okay. in the future. But you've, you've spent a good bit of time over here on and off and yeah. working in studios and whatever, and it's, it's, you, know, you enjoy the yeah. culture, don't you? Really yeah, and I enjoy, it, you know, I enjoy the, um, the way we approach our football here. You know, we gloves off occasionally. Mm. Um, I think our coverage here with Virgin Media is excellent and getting better, and you play no small part in that. <laughs> it's a loving, isn't it? It's a loving. <laughs> no, I think we do it. I think we do it well. Mm. What's the difference between... Ireland and England in terms of the TV and what do you think? I've worked here for several years and I think um, you know Sky back in the UK they have to turn up most days at training grounds and try and get into use with stuff so I think they have to to a point be a little bit more cautious in their approach but I think Sky do a great job as well I mean mm. Sky are easily the, in my opinion easily the best in the UK you know their approach and the guys that do the promos even the, the music they select for the promos is on a different level than mm -hmm. anywhere else and I think you know, the young guys I work with have added greatly to the programme. You know, that's punchier now. Um, willing to follow up with people. Strong opinions. And that's how it should be. Mm. Champions League week. It's obviously why you're over here. What have you made of it? United um, last night. We, we obviously did the game together. Well, we, we were... Yeah, and on the Tuesday I was doing the Spurs game, which wasn't as good as the Liverpool one. Well, the highlights I watched the Liverpool one. Um, great that we've got four teams through. I think Tottenham could could go further in this next knockout stage. I think both Liverpool and Man City um, could go all the way. Mm. I think both of them are the real deal. And I think Man United will find it difficult, whoever they play in the next round. But Man United recently have shown that they, they've got a never-say-die attitude. You know, they come back from seemingly hopeless positions and dig out results. But you can't keep scoring late in the games to get you out of the mire. So I think it's great that, that, that England have four teams through. And I think that when you look at Bayern Munich and you look at who I picked you at like the very Munich, beginning. Don't you? Yeah. And I don't know, it's got, I've got a sneaky feeling for them. You know, the um why? Got the national teams not having a good time. Mm. Bayern not having a good time. But I, I I don't in the back of my head I know They are serial winners though, aren't they? Yeah, I know in my experience, you know, they they're hard, you know, they're well organised mm. all the time, they've got an attitude. Um, which is a very positive one. And I'm going back to the semi-final against Real Madrid last year. They were outplayed Real Madrid in both games, both home and away, yeah. and still got knocked out. Mm. So they weren't lucky on either of those nights. And they got a player sent off as well in one of the games. So I've just, I picked them. Why? If I could choose a game, would I still pick them? I think I'd be more likely to go for one of the English teams. Yeah. Because Liverpool Madrid are not firing all cylinders. Barcelona are not firing all cylinders. PSG, <coughs> I think, will be a threat to everyone. But I think right now, when the draw is made on Monday, I don't think anyone will want to play City or Liverpool. No, far from it. Far from it. But um, go back to United. I know a big game on Sunday, which you'll be at, at mm -hmm. Anfield. I was quite critical of them last year. And a point, point I made, and it, it applies to you as well in terms of because the way to manage now was obviously different. Is it 10 years since you managed? Mm, maybe 12. 12. <coughs> what would you do if you were him now? Because we chat about on air, off air, and we're, we're talking about, th there's a lot of blame flying around. We don't know how much is Mourinho, how much is Pogba, how much is players in, in general. What what do you do if you take over that squad now? So if you, Graeme Sooners, went in, took over Manchester United now, what do you do? Because players now from 12 years ago, they are different. Oh, big time. It's never been harder to manage. I think Man United have, have a good group, not a great group, not by their own standards. They have a good group. I think they're better than what they're showing. Um, and that is a priority for any manager going into a football club is to get the most out of the group. OK, if you're there long enough, you can add to it, bring your own players in, um, which Mourinho's done that. I don't know where the blame ultimately lies. You know, I'm not there on a day-to-day -day basis. You don't know. Um, you will certainly, you shouldn't believe all the stories that are in the press but there, 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 does, there does seem to be an atmosphere there which is not conducive to building a successful football club now is that because the modern day player has got such an opinion and attitude and I think Mourinho refers to it you know the, and I would agree with him on that I think the way the, the, the player the people that surround the modern player protect them all the time who gives the them bad rush. news yeah, nobody. you know the press don't get after them anymore it's always the manager's fault 
The only people, you know, the manager can't get after them because he risks falling out with them. So who gives them bad news? The own treasurer, owner, which Mourinho has referred to, they won't give them any bad news. So would, if you've got a strong dad, would he give you some bad news? Well, certainly my, my father would get after me. So they don't get any bad news. And they live in a little bubble. And but you're, he's very strong-willed. You have got a massive presence, strong-minded, and I'm sure you were even more so mm. as a manager. What do you do going in there, though? Do you sacrifice some of what you stand for, you believe well, I in? Think, I think longevity today in management, if you're, if you're looking to be in it for a long time, is eat humble pie. You have to. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, because I come in and I dig you out and have a go at you. You've got three very close friends. And those three have three very close friends. Me just falling up, you could fall up with half the dressing room. Mm. And I think the modern way, you know, you think, think of Arsene Wenger for argument's sake. To a man, when they announced he was going, they came out, there was no dissenting voices. To a man, they all came out, I've got to thank Arsene for the man I am today. I've got to thank Arsene for the footballer I am today. Mm. And in my, Arsene Wenger, I think, was there 22 years. I can only think of two players. He fell out with they felt that they were critical of him when he left. One was Arshaven, mm. another one was Podolsky. Everyone else left there and what a great guy. That time. is impossible. As far as I'm concerned, that is impossible for a manager to be like that. But then there's that, the argument to be made that he didn't push them hard well, that, That's what I'm saying. That, I think it's impossible to manage and get the best out of a group of players unless you're pushing and pushing and pushing them to the point where you're near, near, nearly falling out with them. And you can't do that. I think you've got to push them to the line and back off. But if you, you know, he was 22 years at a club, great 10 years, 10, 11 years, and then after that, I thought it was a lot of averageness. Mm. And, I, and I, I think anyone who's at a, a club a long, long time, I think a lot of the time you're in humble pie. At, at the big clubs anyway, because you at a big club, you've got big players, and big players are full of themselves. We, like, we know the game has changed drastically, even from when I started playing football. Mm. And I've been critical of our previous Irish manager in terms of I don't think he's given the players what they need. So we haven't got a, a, a supremely talented squad. We're obviously deficient in certain areas. So then I think you need to give players more detail. Mm. I read something the other day about your first week at Liverpool just to highlight the changes in training. Yeah. It was fairly basic, simple. Well, my, my for, your first week. Yeah, my Liverpool. first week. I was transferred, and it's, it's, it is um, relevant. I was transferred for a record between two English clubs. So I turn up on the Monday, and it was walk around Melwood, the training ground, jog around Melwood, a few stretches, five aside, six aside, a few sprints to finish, then go home. That was the four days with a day off. West Brom, first game for me, away from home. Quarter to three, I'm in the dressing room, they're all there Toshak, Emily News, Clement. Our goalkeeper, Tommy Smith, Ian Callahan, Steve Highway, you know, that generation that were just coming to mm. the end of their cycle when I arrived. And I'm looking around the dressing room and, and Joe Fagan, who was which I latterly found out, he was a, you know, he was very, very clever. A real, you know, football man. So I said to Joe, I said, Joe, at quarter to three, I said, Joe, I've been here a week and no one said anything to me. How's it you want me to play? So Joe always spoke in a very quiet, calculated way. So in a big booming voice, he told me to off and we we'll spent all this money on you and you're asking me how to play football. Well, that was the first and last time I ever asked a question. Because in those days it was all about, we've bought you, we think you're a player, your responsibility. That's all, that, that's what it's to deal with it. Was that common Work. though? Because you were the best team then. Yeah. yeah. Now what, what I think Liverpool had at that time, and I like to think that when I became a senior player, I passed it on. You know, good habits, yeah. turning up on time, training properly. Yeah. We certainly went out for a for a beer maybe two times but they would find out about that yeah. Liverpool not being a big city and would would put it in in training the next day but I mean it's all about responsibility and I don't think it, that's the key word that. today they would say to us one of the most common things that I heard in my time at Liverpool work it out for yourself son work it out for yourself and, and you end up you know you think is it that obvious am I am I that stupid I'm not not getting it, and you'd walk away and you'd be thinking about it. And, mm. But they, they knew, but they were saying, you're the man, you, you deal with it. And then you had really good senior pros, and they passed that information down the line. And I don't know if the senior pros do that anymore. I think the when, when do you think that changed? I went, I went to England in 1996, and I, obviously it wouldn't have been the type of scholarship apprenticeship changed before you had. Do you think it was yeah. before then? Changed before you got there. Can you highlight it when? Was it 
latter stages playing career at Liverpool? Was it? I went. Rangers? I was at Liverpool. Left Liverpool in eighty four. I was away seven years and I came back and that changed then. How did you know it was? Uh, um, I said to uh, I, I said to um, I said to Ronnie Whelan one day. I wasn't going to mention. I said to Ronnie, Ronnie Whelan one day. Why? You know, get after them. Why? Why? You know. He said they don't listen anymore. He said they, 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 they just laugh. They just it's a joke. They don't listen anymore. I said, well, go round, put a few on their backside in training. Mm. I'll support you. Yeah. And Ronnie was a proper pro. Ronnie was a proper You're player. Funny, isn't he? Oh, great player. Um, and he, he sort of, he said, it's all changed. Everything's a joke today. They don't, they don't. And that's when, I'd only been away seven years, no seven years. So that's 1990. So it was circa 90. Was that, when, did when, it count out with money, more money coming into the game? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I, I don't, and then subsequently the clubs I managed, I was lucky, I went to Blackburn, I had some really good pros, Gary Flitcroft, Craig Short, you know, a few others, great. They had old school traits in them, didn't they? Yeah, and that, the, the way it used to work, any issues with the players, as a manager, you wouldn't hear about it because they would deal with it. The really important ones, yeah, eventually, mm. but they would solve the problems before it became a problem for you, the manager. And I'm not sure if that's the case anymore. Mm. And I come back to the word responsibility, Keith, it's, you know, it's your football club, you're part of it. You know. Who impresses you managerial wise now then, in, in a way where you mentioned about Wenger, the way that he did do things and he had longevity because he was a certain way. And again, last few years, I think we'd all. There's a lot of that not to admire as well, because I don't think finishing just in the Champions League position was enough for Arsenal. Mm. Arsenal, you know, built their stadium to join the big, yeah. the big guys in Europe. That's not happened. And I think he could have pushed the board for more money and had a right go. Mm. And that was a man that was used to being successful. Who Who I, like? I, I like, I'm a season ticket holder at Bournemouth. I think Eddie Howe's done a great job. What do you like him? Is well, it the style of play, the way he carries the way, himself? Yeah, I think both of those things. You know, working with a, a small club, yeah. 11,000 people at their home games, um, stuck to his principles, which, as I said, I'm a season ticket holder. And I'm, I'm thinking... You know, change it a wee bit, but because when you're trying to play the way that Man City play, I believe he's strong with the players, but still gets the best out of them. So he'd be the one to be approaching that line without going over the line. Yeah. Who else? I mean, you got to see Jurgen Klopp's done a fabulous job. Pep Guardiola, but look at the squad he inherited. You know, Pep's had some great jobs, hasn't he? Do you do you see within the within the game and within the way I would judge some managers? Will be on the length of time. I was quite critical of Mourinho last night. The time that he's been at the club and <coughs> the lack of an identity, which we we were talking about last night. But with Pep, you see the identity, and, and I I agree that he has inherited a good squad. <laughs> You're smirking. Oh. Just that man, stay on Man City. But the, the way he's improved players, yeah, there's a lot of them. He gets the most of. See, he's got, and, and Klopp's approaching that as well. Yeah, you know. The way so people understand the way a football club works. It used to be, you're the manager, the agents would want to befriend the manager. Then they worked out that managers come and go. <laughs> and let's get friendly with the chief executive, because he'll be longer there, he'll be there longer than the manager. Then they went, wait a minute, the owner stroke chairman will be there longer than the chief executive. So what happens today, you fall out with a player, the player speaks to his agent, the agent goes, we're in the past, the agent would go to the manager and say, look, my player's unhappy with you. They skip the manager and they go to the chief executive or they go to the owner if they've got his phone number. And all of a sudden, the manager's undermined. And that's the way it works today. It's never been more difficult for these players, the, the, these managers today. You know, they're undermined every opportunity. Mm. And if you've got a group of 30 players, for argument's sake, so say you've got five injured at any given time, so you've got 25. And then you can only start with 11. So you've got, and then you've got the guys on the bench. You'll have four or five very unhappy players most weeks. And they can't see anything if you're winning. And there can only be one team winning all the time. So it's very easy to manage a team, a, a group, mm. not just 11, when you're winning. Because the ones who would cause you a problem can't cause you a problem because you're winning so all the time. In, yeah. and, and this is where management, the management today is so difficult for these boys. What is it about Klopp then? We see him on the sideline. Do you like 
the way he carries himself? Well, first of all, the way his team plays. Mm. I mean, you have to say, I don't know who's responsible, a committee or who has his final word, but the recruitment, recruitment the has been, been sensational. Days. And, you know, it doesn't matter how good a coach you are. Players are what it's all about. It's never been any different, mm. never will be. And then you say, what's impressed me about Klopp? I think he comes across as a really passionate guy, which is a great fit for Liverpool Football Club. The football they're playing. Um, and I think the way he comes across impressed. With a, but again, I come back to it. When you're winning, everyone's a nice guy. You know, you start off, and this is how it works. You start off in management, and you want to be everyone's friend and you're an open book. And then, and then the walls, you lose a few games and the walls start to close in. You start to be suspicious of people. You fall out with people. And eventually, you've just got your small circle that's around you and the rest are ones to be wary of. And I don't think um, that's ever changed. Did that happen to you on a couple of occasions? Well, every game, every, every job. Yeah, you start off wanting to be helpful to people and then you might feel you've been let down by generally parts of the media. And then people close to you that he thought, you know, they're hundred percent with me. Mm. You only I used to say to players very early on when I took a job, I will find out about you, and you will only find out about me when we lose two or three games back to back. When we're if we're winning games, yeah, we're all trials. winners, we're a strong dresser, and we're all big characters. Mm. But you only find out about people in the football terms and and defeat, you know, how they how they deal with that. Mm. They start to point fingers or they look at themselves first. With the current Liverpool team, two players that have made a big difference have been Alisson and, and Van Dijk. Mm. I know you, I asked you, I actually asked you this in the last couple of weeks, the best centre half you've played with, Alan Hansen, am I right? I think this guy, Van Dijk, has got everything Alan Hansen had. Well, they were both sensational. They both were, he is, sensational centre half. Where Van Dijk is majestic, he's far better than Alan Hansen in there. I think Al would have better passing range. Maybe not. I mean, maybe not, but you've got to remember what the pitches Alan Hansen was trying to thread balls yeah. through on were very different to the ones today. Um, Fair comparisons in terms of quality yeah. of them? Yeah, yeah. You know, Alan Hansen looked like he jumped out of Marks and Spencer's window mm. after we played in January on a muddy pitch. He never went to ground. We were talking about Phil Jones last night, mm. going to ground too much. Hansen, yeah. Alan Hansen, we had a great part. Mark Lawrence and Alan Hansen, after 10 minutes on a muddy pitch in January, Laurel was covered in mud. And I think he was, he was a fabulous player as well. Yeah, I know you liked he, him. Oh, he was an aggressive boy and, and you know, you'd want him in the trenches, trenches with you. He could read it, but I think he just enjoyed Fair smashing man. a few people. Aggressive side of it. Yeah, I think he enjoyed that. And then you had Alan Hansen after 90 minutes in a January muddy pitch, like a jump out of a a shop window, only because he just read everything. Mm. You know, you'd get there early and just poke up where, or get there early and take it off their toes how, and make a pass. How big of a difference does it make? <clears throat> we mentioned Van Dijk on in. There's a little Enormous. bit of criticism. So behind you, you're playing the helmet. Massive difference. And then again, Alisson behind it. Well, you think, I mean, Liverpool were very good last year, but give daft goals away. Mm. Look at the final and of the Champions League. two, three goals. To so they don't, if, they're in the, if they get to the final this year, and you know, a Champions League final, arguably the biggest game you can play at club level, and yet it's nip and tuck. You're bossing the game for 10 minutes, the opposition are bossing it, and that's like that for the first half. You're very much in the game. No one's making a, a rick. But then look what happened to Liverpool last, last year. The goalkeeper, Adam. right away you're like that. Pfft, not a game. Mm. And that spreads through the team. I go back to my last year at Liverpool, 84. We won the trip, we won the treble. Rushy was winning us games, 1-0, 2-1, 2-0. We were a really tight outfit to play against. So one year you considered about 14, 15 goals? No? That was, I think that was, yeah, that was with Clem and goal, that was early 80s, that was at 80 or 81. But, you know, if you've got to be tight and Liverpool, Liverpool now can win games. Liverpool can see it against Napoli for me on Tuesday night, <coughs> if it had been last, last year. year. Um, a lot of them gave them a good chance to, to equalise yeah, when he came yeah. on. See, you, it doesn't matter how good you are, how much of the ball you have, your goalkeeper will have to make a save somewhere in the 90 minutes or mm. save somewhere in 90 minutes. No matter how much you're on the front foot, how much you're bossing the game, you, um, you must have a good goalkeeper. You will not win any big trophies without a proper goalkeeper. Him or De Gea? I, I think I've got to go for De Gea because 
he's, d he's done it. What is, is it? Consistent. For, for his last four or five years, he's won the Sir Matt Busby Trophy. He's the player, their player of the year. Mm. I mean, he's been fabulous, hasn't he? He, he does things like the great Pat Jennings used to do, where he'd save it with his you too, you can't remember Pat Jennings, what a goalkeeper he was. He used to save things with his knees and his legs, you know, he shinned his feet. Orthodox. But but technically a great goalkeeper as well. I mean, De Gea is top class. And I know he had a difficult World Cup, but he is top class. Yeah. The the midfield position has changed as we know. Even when I was coming through it was very much a four four two. You you had to do everything that a midfielder was expected to mm -hmm. do. Whereas now they're pigeonholed into Holland. And I know it's a bugbear, it's even a bugbear of mine. So you know, I don't think it's you well, showing your age. I, I in well, totally game, agree with you about game, it. If the game's never changed, right? The modern game, and we're guilty of it, we rattle off these stats. The modern midfield player today, his stats would suggest that you know, he never gives the ball away. But he's passed the ball 10 yards square mm. in his own half when another team have retreated into their half. You know, again, I come back to, I can only talk about Liverpool, that's where the biggest part of my education came. The most common thing you would have heard on the training ground when we were playing small-sided games would have been from Ronnie Moran saying, look forward, that's cheap, going sideways, I could play that ball, look forward. Now, the modern player today, I love it when he, you know, he gets the ball, sorry, they're in possession, in their own half, deep in their own half, and he goes into the back four or back three and takes a 10-yard pass off his centre half when the team have retreated into their half and he passes it out to the left, another 10-yard pass. What's that? Yeah. But my stats tell you I never give the ball away. A few years ago, who completed, I'll go back six years ago, who had the best um, stat for accuracy. accuracy of passing in the Premier League? About six years ago. Was he midfielder? No. <laughs> you never got. It was Mertesacker at Arsenal. Right. Ten yards that way, five yards that way, ten yards that way. What I would say, though, about your standards for a, for a midfielder are so high. So when you say you, you say that, they are. They, they obviously are because of the level you played at. So... When I look at Liverpool's midfield, I see Henderson dropping into a pocket of space. And I've said this to you before, he's not good enough to have it in a tight, congested area. That's why he has to give himself a little bit. I said it about Fellaini last night, should have made yeah. the angle a bit more because just Mid you could have it in a phone box and hold someone yeah. off and then play it. And the top players can, but... Midfield, an ideal where midfield sh midfielders should be getting the ball between the striker they're playing against and the midfielder they're playing against. Not the other way around. In front of the eleven players they're yeah. playing against. Yeah. Because think of this: say I'm playing with a with a back four, right? I'm an, I'm playing in the Liverpool team. We've got mm. a back four. So Robertson's gone, and Alexander Trent Alexander's gone that side. And I go back and I go back into the back four, and I take a pass of Joe Gomez. Yeah. So I'm now square with Joe Gomez and Van Dyke. And Henderson, um, Robertson slightly in advance of me, and Trent slightly in, in advance of me. Yeah. And my goalkeeper's behind me as well. So I now get the ball, I, I turn, I'm a midfield player for Liverpool, and I turn, and the 11 players I'm playing against have all dropped into their half. So I've now got my back four, my goalkeeper and me, that's six players. Yeah. So that means I've got five players I'm having to find amongst 11 of theirs. Yeah. Double difficult. So that's... Mm. Uh, you know, I'm bit, maybe Liverpool are the wrong one to talk about in that respect because they, they, they're such a fabulous team right now. But the modern players, they drop in and get the ball and they look as if they're getting lots of touches, but they're doing nothing with it. goes back to the way they're getting he, taught the game, though, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, I come back to Ronnie Moran. Look forward. Get it in there. You first look, get the ball, look forward. You know, if you, the, the last position you want, in a poor team today, the last place you want to play is a centre forward. I've got sympathy with, with Lukaku because they never told you? You know, because you've got to look at the midfield. You know, a, a centre forward wants the ball quick and he wants it accurately. Mm. He wants to see a midfield player get it, get it out of his feet and hit him right away. Fine. He doesn't want the ball played into him, touch, 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 and then attempt to pass. Because the opportunity for him to get free and get a shot at goal is gone. Mm. So staying on that midfield position then, if you were, where would you play if it was a midfield three? Graham Sooners. Would you be the six, the, the holder? Yeah. I, in today's game? <coughs> yeah, you see, we talk about the modern game. I, my position would be no different. I'd be a holding midfield player. 
I, I, there's, so if you listen to the, the um, people talk about the modern game, attacking fullbacks are a new thing. Well, I played in three, cup, three European Cup finals, and I, Alan Kennedy scored in one in open play, and Phil Neal scored in another one in open play. So we, what, what people could never work, work out when, when they played against Liverpool is that we always had extra men in midfield, and, our, and we had our two fullbacks. When I got the ball, as we were talking about, our two fullbacks were in front of me. They're always in front of me. Yeah. So people couldn't work out why we kept the ball so well, and why we had more of the ball than whoever we played against generally. Well, but if they went wingers rolled in. Yeah, and then the, the, the wider men, Jimmy Case, Sammy would be pushed on, or Ray Kennedy would be pushed on the other side, or Ronnie, when he first got in the team, would be pushed on. We always had more bodies in there, mm. and we kept it all better. Mid-fit. We knew the game, hasn't, the game hasn't really changed. Trying to reinvent the wheel. But it was something that, I love the terminology. Yeah, Bob Paisley would, I can remember him saying, yeah, what, what's that leading the line mean? <laughs> and there was a blindside run, and he had to chuckle. So, you know, the, the, that terminology was sneaking, sneaking into the game when he was managing. And what he'd make of the gobbledygook today with technical cages and high presses and low presses and... Oh, don't get me started. But they do, I, they do need more instructions I made now. A, so you, you, your area, the players, they brought, and you were getting it from the soil and work it out all along. Now, they can't work it out. I think the top, top players can because it's not an issue for them because they're on That's a different 100% level. correct. But the vast majority of even Premier League players, you mentioned Eddie Howe, I think his players need massive detail. And the reason they are so effective is because of him. I, I, made him, I, I look back at my career when I was managing stroke coaching. I made, a, I made a very obvious mistake. I never went on a coaching course. And I, um, like most players who played at a decent level, if you go into coach, I, why is he not getting it? Why am I having to tell him all the time? Mm. You get frustrated by that. And... Um, then I went on a coaching course when I was finished with it. I thought, I'll go on this coaching, see if, if you know, if I'm... Miss- and I it. went on it, and um, the only thing I took away from a coaching course was, I say the only thing, vital thing, what we're talking about, revisit, revisit. What that basically means is, <laughs> tell them every day if you have to, twice a day if you have to, mm. ten times a day if you have to. But, you know, as I, I come back to the very first story we told at Liverpool, work it out for yourself, Sam. Mm. You think that players can do that, but a lot of players, unfortunately, can't. If you, if you had to play in a three-man midfield currently in the Premier League, what two would you like in there with you? Oh. I think I know one. I'd have De Bruyne. How old you? Yeah. So would you be the sitter in two, or would you have... I would sit De Bruyne on my left-hand side. Oh, I'd just let him play. I mean, you, <laughs> I mean, are we classing Hazard as a midfield player? No. Silva? David Silva? There you go, friend. <laughs> I mean, hey, the boys, you just... Get on with it. Yeah. Special players. And that's where there's maybe just an opening for Liverpool right now. Both of them are injured. Both of them. Mm. What, do you, what do you think, Sunday and Liverpool United? Well, on... Current form, I, obviously, I, I, points to Liverpool. Keith, going, back to when I, going back to when I was, a, when I was playing, I, and I'm really, I hate saying that, but I can't think of I mean, You know, when I'm on the telly, when I was a player, I know people go... <laughs> but I can only make this comparison that when I played, we were the better team... And United weren't, you know, weren't anywhere near us. Mm. Say that. Maybe that's wrong, but they weren't winning things. Still had top players, but they weren't winning things. And we never ever had an easy game against them. They would push us all the way. Because of the rivalry. Because of the historical rivalry. And I expect the same. Liverpool, you've got a fancy at home, playing really well. A few defensive issues as well, though, haven't they, Liverpool? Matip out now as well. Obviously, Gomez out, Alexander Arnold. So. so they'll have to play Lovren then? Probably. But I think you fancy in Liverpool if you're sitting here. I mean, see, United are, <coughs> just briefly, and we touched on that last night, Jose does know he's best 11. Two and a half years into the job. I, does the, it's not alarming, though, considering he's either signed a lot of them, decided to keep them, given them new contracts. Yeah, if you're a United supporter, you know, you want continuity. You want... To, as a manager, normally a couple of years in, you've got six or seven that are core. Yeah. I don't think United have that. Mm. I, I don't think United have that. I don't... I mean, who's the one consistent? Uh, for you, the goalkeeper. Mm. I, mean, I mean, back four, he chops and changes, searching for something. Midfield, 
chops and changes, searching for up front the exact same. Mm -hmm. So that's not a great place to be. You want to be in a settled situation where they're forming relationships and sort of understandings. Um, but r right now, Man, Man United don't have that. And they've not had that for a couple of years now. They don't know what the best starting 11 is or what the best system is even. And that's a worry. In Liverpool, the opposite. Mm. You know, they're going into it knowing the system they play. There'll be seven or eight that know they're definitely going to play. And that, that's an enormous advantage. When you look at that Liverpool team, I think the goalkeeper's 25, 26. I think Van Dijk's 26 or 27. Yeah. And then the, the rest are just boys. boys yeah. they, they could, barring injury, and if, if Van Dijk stays, decade together, 10 years together, what a position they're in. Mm. Especially with that front three well, as it's well. It's a bit like Wenger getting an Arsenal job, the best back five in <coughs> Europe at the time. Dixon, Winterburn, was it? Adams and Bold, Bold. Bold, yeah. and Seaman behind the them. Best back five. Mm. And on that, that's the foundation then. Mm. And um, Liverpool right now are looking like the real deal. I think. You surprised they've kept pace with Man City? No. No. I, people were saying because Salah wasn't getting his goals. You know, he got 44 goals last year. You know, he won't, I don't see him getting 44 again this year, but I think he'll get in his 30s. Mm. And that's still a phenomenal season. Said he needs a producer, don't you, for a few years before he's... Yeah, I feel, I feel you know, when you're talking about Dalglish or Rush. Grace. Yeah, you've got, you got to be doing it for a decade, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. Where could Liverpool go? You, you know, you're always... Look, it's my team, I feel like. You think, what could go wrong? I mean, I'm surprised Van Dijk ended up at Liverpool. Because I think when they didn't get him first time round... Ship had sailed. I'm thinking Barcelona are alerted. PSG. Real Madrid, any of the really big guys, because he would walk into all their teams. Mm. And but he's a Liverpool supporter, so he might be happy to stay there for the next mm. eight to ten years, which would be great news. Because you know what, you know he is a rock. He's a proper one. Um, they sniff round him possibly, and if Salah gets another thirty odd goals this year, sniff round him. But if they can keep that group together, I think they're destined to win things. You can't guarantee it. Yeah. It can be just unlucky. But I think with an even, you know, an even amount of luck, I think they're destined to win things. Before we let you go, I've got to chat about the facial hair. Um, again. I'm under extreme pressure to um, get it off Soonest. from my youngish wife, yeah. She's not having it? No, she doesn't like it. She used to be young wife, but now she's youngish wife. <laughs> and she points out she'll always be younger than me. I quite like it. Coming up you don't Christmas. count, mate. You don't count. I mean, I, you know, you get... <laughs> I'm like most men, I just do as I'm told. <laughs> Listen, I really appreciate no, it's popping been good. in. Thank Pleasure. you very much. Pleasure, Keith. So that's all we got time for. Uh, Philly was in earlier. I really enjoyed his company. Pleasure to have Graham in the building. Uh, we shall see you next week. Usual time, half 12. Download it on the usual platforms. Until then, take care.